Uh-huh. Next talk of our morning session is by Gerhard Heinzmann, Poincaré from a philosophical point of view. Thank you very much. So first, I will thank the scientific committee for this invitation. Then, I, it is, uh, it's good, sir? OK. Then my talk overlaps with several remarks done by Professor Fine and Professor Gray. And, uh, but finally, uh, learning is by imitation and repetition. So <laughs> perhaps you uh, can grasp better some, some points on Poincaré's uh, philosophy. Now, the summary of my, my points is uh, first I will give a introduction as uh, Professor Fine, is Poincaré a philosopher? Then some general elements of Poincaré's philosophy and these elements will be declined in uh, 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 different respects in arithmetic, geometry, mechanics, physics and a conclusion. So, first of all, Poincaré is Poincaré philosopher. Now, to see what is going on, we should perhaps first determine what distinguishes a philosopher from a scientist. Until the 19th century, there are terminological connections. For example, Newton's theoretical mechanics is entitled Philosophia Naturalis. Linné wrote the Philosophia Botanica, Lamarck, Philosophie Zoologique. But there are not only, uh, there, there are more. Since Aristotle, there is not only a terminological, but even a systematical connection between philosophy and science. Both philosophy and science give justification of our actions. But the mode of consideration of philosophy is catholu, general, and the mode of the special science is kata, miros, particular. Now, what means general? The philosopher tries to justify the conceptual framework of scientific knowledge. He has to invent the conceptual presupposition useful for scientific knowledge and to clear up the scientific activity in its symbolic form. So philosophy is not after science, the Spenster cabinet, not before science, but involved in science. And here, naturally, we, we find Poincaré. Now, if you have such a position, there are two, two perspectives. One, one perspective is to say that uh, uh, philosophy has a normative approach, fixing conditions for what must be criteria of science. Naturally, scientists don't like it, because uh, if uh, uh, you should uh, make revisions of your science, you will not be happy about this. And I think philosophy so says nothing. That's what the metaphysicist. Uh, task. In contrast, a purely descriptive approach limits itself to describing science in action. Nachschwätzerei. So philosophy reduced to history. This is a positive word. And, but philosophers don't like it. You, you know that the most, since the, since the uh, old times, biggest difference is between history and philosophy. This is a completely different uh, uh, perspectives. Now, one solution is moderate naturalism. Philosoph philosophy cannot articulate reality independently of the conceptual schemes used in science. And the epistemological justification of beliefs and proposition has its origins in scientific practice. This perspective can now be considered in a D 
dispute, in a classical dispute, and uh, Professor Fine uh, uh, spoke about uh, this dispute about, uh, between realists and anti-realists. This can be, uh, you can consider this dispute under different perspectives, under semantic perspectives, that means the realist says, scientific propositions are true and false independently of us. I make in red, what is Poincaré's position? Yes, for logic, he says this. Logic, he is not an intuitionist in, in logic. He accepts the principle of bivalence, that means, not, not, uh, not a tersis, not a, a tertium notato, but the principle of bivalence, which means every proposition is false or uh, true. He accepts it. And you can be anti realist, thus, uh, truth is an epistemic. Uh, uh, notion, and uh, or rules there are in mathematics, the constructivist will say, there are rules, and rules have no truth values. And Poincaré, for some, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, domain, he is an anti-realist too. So from an ontological point of view, Natalie, we, uh, Professor Fine uh, uh, told it, Poincaré says the relation are the only objective reality. So they, maybe they exist. <coughs> but there are uh, uh, terms described only apparently theoretic entities. He says this too, because singular terms, in effect, objects, are not existing for Poincaré. <coughs> so in one sense, he says this is indifferent hypothesis. In another sense, he is anti-realist too. Concerning the continuity problem, he is clearly a realist because he says that there is an invariance and an invariance between all the structure and the history, uh, between all the theory and the history is the structure. We heard it. And then, naturally, it is the uh, distinction between extern and intern, and there, he is, uh, reality is independent of our mind and our knowledge. No, here, Poincaré is clearly an idealist. So, is Poincaré a philosopher? Is Poincaré's position incoherent? Because he's a realist and anti-realist. No, I think, rather, the alternative between realists and anti-realists is obsolete. Naturally, this is uh, Noah, uh, uh, a professor, uh, uh, finds position. But I will go more in a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic direction. Poincaré finds a pragmatic way out between Kant's idealism and Helmholtz's empiricism, preparing Nelson Goodman's approach for a specialist, and uh, he is between anti-rem and in-re structuralism. What means this? Anti-rem structuralism means uh, if you are a structuralist, now there is the structure. And <coughs> is the structure a mathematical object? If you are a structuralist, the structure should be itself a position in the structure, so you have a, a regress. And if you are in a ray structuralist, you say the structure is an abstraction of positions, but these positions should be done in, uh, that there should be a, a available a background theory, and the background theory should be, because you see a structuralist, should be a, have a structure. So you have there a regress on the other side. Both positions seem not to be uh, current. But, uh, so I will, uh, I will show you that Poincaré is between these two, uh, two perspectives, and he is a great philosopher, and modern philosophy of science has one of its origins in Poincaré's approach. Now, what is uh, uh, Poincaré's philosophical approach, in accordance with the empirical maxim, the construction of reality must be guided by experience. In accordance with the idealist viewpoint, viewpoint, experience is not sufficient. It is only the occasion to become aware of certain mathematical categories of the mind with which we must accord our experience with decision or convention. And in accordance with moderate naturalism, 
Scientific development and predictions serve as supplementary arbitrators of the suitability of the chosen conventions. Now, in this talk, I don't emphasize the historical context nor the historical stringency of Poincaré's argumentation. I'm indeed interested in the question if Poincaré's writings give the conceptual possibility to classify him today belonging to the philosophical tradition. It is. He, he is a big philosopher for philosophers. So some general elements of Poincaré's philosophy. There are two traditions to interpret uh, Poincaré. One is uh, he is, you say, he's an intuitionist. He has an intuitionist tendency. And at the same time, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he considers the prispolemics against <coughs> logicism and formalism, so against Russell and Hilbert and, and so on. On the other side, uh, one opts for a <coughs> conventional and linguistic aspect of his work. And uh, my thesis is that the intuitive and the formal aspects are two sides to the same coin. Poincaré always supports the same philosophy. It consists in a reconstruction program of the process of understanding theories, of understanding theories. And here, it is not yet uh, appeared, but uh, uh, Jeremy Gray's uh, scientific biography of Poincaré that will appear, I think, in, in one month by uh, Princeton. If you read this, then you understand what means Poincaré by understanding theory. So I think it is the best work on Poincaré. Uh, he gave, gave me the, uh, a copy to do the exposition. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. So now the construction of scientific objects is simultaneously conceived with the construction of language. Or more exactly, the empirical basis is the occasion of the process of language learning. This is what Poincaré is doing with us. And, but not language learning up over, as Descartes or something like this. No, there are, we, we are already uh, uh, able to, uh, to understand, but one, from time to time, the understanding is interrupted, and there uh, he will know why, why, why it is so and not in the other way. Huh? Perhaps we, we, we uh, discussed Hilbert, and uh, uh, Hilbert gives uh, very beautiful axiomatic systems of geometry. Poincaré says, wonderful, but I cannot understand what geometry is by this by his axiomatic system. I cannot understand f uh, uh, why uh, there, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, constant curvature is important, for example. So now, second thesis, the interface between language structures and experience is the term hypothesis. It's a valuable indicator of the difference and the analogies of different sciences mathematical sciences and physics, and its semantic function is declined by Poincaré with respect to the link between the liberty of creativity and the guidance by experience. Now, the, Poincaré, the, the problem Poincaré is concerned with is the achievement of an equilibrium between the very traditional problem of the relation between objectivity and subjectivity that concerns, in fact, the relation, if now I take the vocabulary of Moritz Schlick, between knowledge and intuition, or erkenntnis, erlebnis, or if you take the Russell uh, uh, terminology, between knowledge by description, objective description, and subjective acquaintance. We have seen it already. The relations uh, should be common to many minds, transmissible by discourse, could not be concerned outside of a mind, and there are sensation actions on the other side. It is intransmissible, pure quality. 
But one point is especially important for me. He wrote in the introduction of uh, value of science, the only real objective reality, le véritable réalité, is the internal harmony of the world. So there is a, 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 a static component. And we will, I will uh, uh, say later what it means. Now, like many philosophers at the end of the 19th century, Poincaré emphasizes the genetic point of view. What distinguished Poincaré from other authors is his systematic, but not historical, interpretation of the genesis. Resembling what the logical empiricists called a reconstruction program, this is what he, he, he makes the same. It's a reconstruction program, but the difference consists in the fact that it includes an aesthetic element, and this is excluded by naturally by the uh, logical empiricist. Now I come to the, the core of uh, this talk. Uh, the local forms of uh, how do you, you can decline it in uh, different uh, sciences. Poincaré distinguished a priori principle, for example, the complete induction, the principle of recurrence in arithmetic, from conventions as apparent hypotheses, for example, the parallel axiom in geometry, and from hypotheses as generalization, for example, the hypothesis phosphorus melts at 44. 44 degree. Placed side by side, all of these notions express local forms specific to the different fields considered of Poincaré's philosophical problem, whose principal subject is, and I emphasize this, the epistemological questions of the relational form of scientific knowledge and its exact formulation with respect to our subjective acquaintance. Now, how it works in arithmetic. Naturally, one of the most interesting questions is the justification of the principle of recurrence. I give here, you will understand later why, a uh, uh, second order a formulation. You know this. And uh, now, how to justify the principle of recurrence? If you think perhaps that what it do, Poincaré, he was not, uh, this was old mathematics and uh, Today, it is no problem. Uh, you can, uh, uh, for, for example, one way to define the, the natural number by explicit definitions. This is the explicit definition, a natural number uh, who is uh, an uh, inductive, uh, inductive uh, number. So this is the definition given by Data Kind and Russell, and then you have immediately the, the induction principle. Now, what is with this? Uh, one condition, uh, it, it is clear uh, what, what you should do here is if you say it's analytic, there is, you see there, is this analytic? There is more than, uh, than logic. Right? There is set theory. This is naturally very important for philosophers because logic, uh, you can, you can uh, this is uh, Denis Bonnet here from Paris. He, he uh, showed it uh, for uh, five years in this very brilliant dissertation that if you take the normal uh, consideration of logic as general and uh, you can substitute and all these things, you come to arithmetic uh, already with, with, with logic. So uh, the, the formal, the, what you call the formal logic, it's not, it's, it, the, the, the consideration what is logic is naturally a difficult question. This is not, it's not simple. But we can, we can say, okay, let's go. First order logic is, is logic, okay. It's, it's not, in fact, it's not so easy to say. That Poincaré, he, he's right too. It's not so easy. So now uh, the justification. We are here, so they are justificated by the, uh, uh, by the uh, explicit definition uh, in a uh, 
uh, Russell Manner. But now philosophical uh, objection, naturally, Poincaré first says that set theory is not logic. And secondly, but this definition is impredicative. This de definition uh, one here is naturally impredicative because uh, this uh, natural number is defined between a totality and it is uh, it itself, it is a part of the totality. So this is, this is called by him an impredicative procedure. And now why we should not, uh, uh, why we should avoid an impredicative procedure? Because um, the realist approach behind this implies a contradiction. It is responsible for the unrestricted application of the action of comprehension, which leads to a famous type of logical antinomies. Platonism is here drawn up as a methodical fallacy. If it applies to a list to an accept a postulate that, the, that there exists a y and y is the x with the ax, as a for, for uh, every prop propositional function, that follows together with the definition of the element relation uh, this one, the, the action of comprehension. And uh, if you take, uh, there exists a y, y you take e and uh, I, a to x, x is not an element of x, you have naturally the contradiction. So uh, this uh, contradiction is interpreted by Poincaré is, uh, as, uh, as a fault, a philosophical error. The philosophical error, it is realist, uh, the, the, to be realist uh, uh, in, uh, in philosophy. Now Poincaré's solution. He says, we have the faculty of conceiving that a unit might be added to a collection of units. Thanks to experience, we have had the occasion of exercising this faculty and are conscious. So the indefinite repetition is occasioned by experience without being itself empirical and constitutes as such a theoretical part of our knowledge. And complete induction, he says, is nothing but the affirmation of the power of the mind, which now is itself capable of conceiving the indefinite repetition of the same act when this act is once possible. The mind has of this power direct intuition and express, and experience can for it nothing but an occasion to make use of it, and by this to become aware of it. So, Fact, experience is the ratio cognoscendi of the affirmation of the fact that is a domain can be constructed through an act of indefinite repetition. A property is valid for all elements. It is valid for the successor of any elements. So, uh, in fact, in arithmetic, we seem to use neither hypothesis nor convention, but an operative intuition a priori. Now, this operative intuition a priori should be very, very strong, huh? because naturally for Poincaré, and this is why I, I, I formulated in a, a second order version, the principle of reference, we should exclude non-standard models. Hmm? And in fact, naturally, if you have, if you, if you say, uh, you repeat the iteration, is, the iteration is completely different from the affirmation that you can repeat it, because his formulation, the affirmation, is nothing other than the final clause. All numbers can be constructed in this manner. And the final clauses, if you, if you have the both together, you have the, the induction principle. And this is naturally, this is now a very strong intuition that we cannot, uh, against Wittgenstein, uh, the, this here, here is uh, the, uh, we have a, a capacity about entities, and Wittgenstein says, no, this is too intuitive. There is a, too a strong intuition. And here, Poincaré, as a mathematician, it is necessary to do mathematics, so we have to accept it, do it. OK, now, uh, we compare. The principle of complete, uh, 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 Poincaré compares the principle of uh, complete induction as a necessary tool of mathematics with the understanding of the principle of empirical induction. The latter is a natural hypothesis, he said, 
or a practical rule in the sense of a necessary tool of physics. Without this empirical induction principle, you cannot do physics. And that is the, the, that's the nature. You have to presuppose that the nature is ordered in some the, the principle of causality. Or something like this. Now, the stridding analogy of complete induction with the usual process of induction lies in the function to be both tools in order to structure different domains. These tools are suggested by experience for the, uh, for the uh, mathematical induction and for the other induction, but are themselves inaccessible to experience. So, Poincaré intends to confront a mathematical theory with the experience. From a systematical point of view, every time the result is a hypothesis. In arithmetic, Given the analogy with the physical induction principle, the intuitive faculty of indefinite repetition could be called a natural hypothesis, which is inaccessible to experience, but suggested by it. It made good sense to say that a synthetic a priori element constrains the natural hypothesis. So, in fact, uh, Poincaré uses here uh, apparently uh, oh, uh, apparently a completely uh, Kantian uh, formulation. But what he's doing is, is to say, so we have concrete repetition. And the concrete repetition is, is not enough. We cannot add one thing to another. But I have not this what is necessary in mathematics. This is only the ratio cognoscenti to have this uh, faculty of indefinite repetition, and he calls this synthetic a priori. But in fact, it is a state, status because he says the, this is conventional that the uh, concrete uh, repetition should be, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, adapted to this, uh, this uh, mathematical intuition. And you can call this an, a natural hypothesis without this faculty of indefinite repetition, you cannot do mathematics, and mathematics should always be together uh, with the, the objective and the uh, subjective element. So it is synthetic a priori, right, Poincaré <laughs> says it, but in a systematic manner, I think you can say it is a natural hypothesis. So what is in analysis? In analysis, the indefinite repetition with respect to the symbolism is con is a conventional adaption of our theoretical experience. He says, uh, if I have a, a square and a circle in a square, and then the diagonal, the, the intersection point, cannot be ration, rational, naturally. And so he gives a lot of examples. And since this is the, the experimental part, now the experiment is now naturally in mathemat ma mathematical experience. The experimental part is of mathematics is to show that we should uh, have the, the, the continuum, the, the real numbers. Uh, he is, uh, it is a bad, uh, a bad argumentation uh, a bit because naturally, if he says that it is the indefinite repetition, he is explicitly uh, thinking about the uh, Dedekind cuts but this supposes a total infinity, so he cannot accept it. And, uh, uh, and so he is, uh, in this point, is not very clear, and he says it's an intuitive, uh, intuitive capacity, but he is not able, contrary to the uh, induction principle, to, to uh, uh, design exactly, to determine exactly the intuitive element of this uh, capacity, of this capacity to construct a continuity. Now, in geometry, the geometrical space is obtained by choosing the language of group to serve as tool of reasoning about representation of muscular sensation. I present four steps to the so-called the result is the so-called absolute space, the, the space without metric. In a, and uh, uh, by supposing that the geometry is only at constant curvature. The first step, similarly to Carnap's Aufbau, and I'm sure that Carnap, he was very well, he was very well read Poincaré, uh, 
Uh, the starting point is a definition of two two place relation. We will turn up, this is a two place relation resemble. And here in Poincare, two two place relation. Uh, what is this relation? Uh, here, an external change A with X A Y for X change in Y without muscular sensation. So you see there's a car pass. And the internal change with X S Y for X change in Y accompanied by muscular sensation. So you, you, uh, uh, or you have a sphere and you turn the sphere. One to, you, you can compensate this, this uh, rotation by going on the other side. This is the first step. Then he, uh, he uh, introduced a classification of external change. Among external change, some can be compensated by internal change, others cannot. And the first are called change of position, and uh, the second change of state. Naturally, if you have a glass of water and you, you, uh, it, you, you have a chemical process, you can turn it to, uh, there's nothing. Uh, changed. So uh, third step, modulo an identity condition with respect to the compensation by internal change. The, the identity the condition are two external change equivalent if they can be cancelled by the same internal change, approximately cancelled. Poincaré defines the equivalence class of changes of position and calls it a displacement. So displacement is an equivalence class and so on, then it is repeatable. So we can recognize that two displacements are identical. And finally, uh, the main result is that the set of displacements classes, that are external and internal together, form a continuous group in the mathematical sense. Uh, to continuity is another, uh, is, a, is another difficult point. It should, uh, as a group, it should be continuous. This is intuitive too. Now, What's the conclusion of this? The general concept of a group is a form of our understanding existing in our mind. This, uh, this uh, group actions is a structure. It is the natural hypothesis of, if you prefer, a synthetic a priori element. The set of presupposed relations satisfying the group actions is exemplified and specified by the specific displacement structure which is a continuous transformation group, which is the mathematical expression of relation between sensations and the psychological principle, the mathematical expression of the psychological principle of free mobility. Now, the aesthetic component of this group structure can be seen in the fact that it's exemplified, exemplified mean, has some characters in common in a big variety of systems, element this is the element of harmony. That means mathematics is harmonic, or there is a harmony, because you can if, uh, see certain structures which you can use in all domains. And naturally, for Poincaré, there's a first are groups, and then it's topology. And you have a top topological intuition too. Right? Geometry is replaced by uh, later by a topology. And Aesthetic means nothing that does. Oh, but this is, this is a lot of things, because it means to see, to see the, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, characters in common. This is the point was, was Dieudonné always criticized by Poincaré, because Poincaré, he, uh, if you go in a topological, uh, in this topological uh, writings, then he is acting and thinking about figures and uh, in a topological way. And uh, naturally, it is, if you, if you uh, have not the, the uh, good perspective, it, it is, uh, the, the reasonment is, is not correct. This means aesthetic uh, uh, reasonment. So now there is an empirical. Uh, uh, under determination, naturally, I have not yet uh, uh, spoken about this. The form of convention where exists a choice between different possibilities, because uh, naturally you think in Poincaré conventional, there is the con 
convention is that there is agreement and uh, with respect to disagreement, we have different choice that they are equivalent. And uh, until now, convention was only, is only a sort of classification, it's only an adaption of, uh, of a not precise uh, uh, experience which is um, uh, made precise by the mathematical structure. And now this is a new, a new uh, comprehension of convention where the, uh, when, when you uh, study now this uh, transformation group, the property of this transformation group, you study several subgroups and then you have the, the, the choice between these uh, different uh, uh, geometries, uh, uh, Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. And, uh, but now this empirical underdetermination of the groups has only a purely contrastive uh, character, as uh, this is a, a term of state for it, uh, if the groups are isolated from the background beliefs about the world. It means uh, what Poincaré said, okay, I have the choice, and this is with the interpretation, is the same thing. I have the choice between Copernic and uh, Ptolemy. In the mathematical sense, I can do it. But if I have a more holistic view, if I uh, take the consideration of commodity as simplicity in geometry, then the Euclidean geometry is, uh, is to prefer. Now, look Poincaré against Hilbert. Poincaré is often quoted Credo saying that in mathematics the word exist means exempt of contradiction, must be seen under non-Hilbertian light. He never was interested to have a non-contradiction proof as Hilbert. For reasons concerning overall the involvement of impredicative procedures, Poincaré excludes to prove mathematical reliability by consistency proof in the Hilbert right, so the direct consistency proof, because he says it is necessary to have an induction, and the induction is known predicative, and so on. So, how it, what, it, what he is doing? The reliability of geometrical space is for him given by its psychopsychological genesis using the tool of real actions with imagined sensation. In fact, this is a very complicated uh, construction between, because Poincaré, if you read it uh, uh, consciously, he is, is not an experimenter, he's not uh, going to how it, uh, in a uh, psychological way or in a, uh, uh, the, the physiological way, he makes no experiment. It is in, the, in its head, it's an imagined sensation. What would happen if I will grasp an object, he says. And he takes a structural position without disengaging completely meaning and knowledge from ostension. His concept of structure constitutes a development of the traditional algebraic one. That means, naturally, the they are not uh, the geometrical uh, uh, actions are not propositions, but they are only conventions, neither true nor false. And the justification, because you have no propositions, by Hilbert, is done by the uh, consistency proof. By Poincaré, it is done by the exemplification. And exemplification means now, uh, not in a model theoretic manner, exemplification. It's not going in model theory and using, uh, using the set theory, because set theory you can use. It is, it is an informal way in a formal way to exemplify, uh, exemplificate. And this is the aesthetic element of mathematics, naturally. Uh, now, this is not so, the, the, it's, it's clear that Poincaré is more an artist in the sense as, as Hilbert was, it's, it's clear. But uh, you do remember all that Poincaré uh, distinguished very well between uh, uh, mind of uh, a logician and the mind which is intuitive. This is the intuitive character. Now, the schema of uh, generalization in mechanics, experience provides complex phenomena which we reduce into a number of elementary phenomena. This is interesting too. Huh? They are complex phenomena and not a single phenomenon. 
to physical induction, we move from the phenomenon to the experimental fact, and by means of differential equation to Lowe's and verifiable hypothesis. Lowe's can be elevated by degree to the status of conventional principle. It's the same, now the same thing as it made in, in arithmetic, the same thing as it made in, in a geometry. He's going from a law or from something which is not completely correct to something which is correct here by convention. This is a, a principle. It's a long uh, uh, quotation. Uh, I, I will not uh, uh, read all this. And the better, uh, because you, so you can find it in the value of science. Uh, uh, one can, uh, uh, a law, if you, it is very well confirmed, you say a law is now a principle, and then it, it's uh, out of the uh, way to uh, test, to test this principle. Now, what are the uh, more interesting? The methodological analogy between geometry and mechanics. In geometry, the conventions or definitions are chosen as a function of objects, so lead bodies or rise, that are not those of geometry. This is very important. And we presuppose the category of group. The empirical underdetermination is restricted by consideration of commodity and simplicity. Now, in mechanics, the conventions are convenient even with respect to mechanical objects and are, for this reason, generalizations. They are not generalizations in the other, in the other way. This is a con conventional, and the other is a conventional decision. It is not a generalization. Generalization is an empirical, uh, empirical uh, procedure, and the decision is a linguistic procedure. And uh, the empirical systematic non-epistemic underdetermination, we have no other way to, uh, to, to, to formulate reality, is restricted now by holistic consideration. A physical theory is by so much the more true as it puts in evidence more true relations, was quoted by Professor Fine too. Now, Poincaré's big dissolution. Poincaré's model of explanation, founded in a minimum of well-confirmed hypotheses, directly or indirectly by means of fictions, and from which all meaningful propositions can be deduced, is called into questions by Maxwell's approach. The English scientist, he says, does not try to erect a unique, definitive, well-arranged building. This is Poincaré. It should be well-arranged, all this, what is in, in the, philosophically. He was a philosopher. He seems to raise rather a large number of provisional and independent constructions, between which communication is difficult and sometimes impossible. And he says the same thing about Einstein in his uh, letter to Weiss. Uh, he makes a, a report on Einstein and he says, Il ne, oh, pardon, uh, Il ne reste pas attaché au principe classique et en présence d'un problème de physique est prompt à envisager toutes les possibilités. Cela se traduit immédiatement dans un esprit par la prévision de phénomènes nouveaux, susceptibles d'un jour vérifiés par l'expérience. Je ne veux pas dire que toutes ces prévisions résisteront au contrôle de l'expérience le jour où ce contrôle deviendra possible. C'est-à-dire, ça, c'est une approche qui, qui est... Poincaré ne le comprend pas, il ne veut pas. Non, il comprend très bien, mais il n'accepte pas. De, mais de sa, sa position philosophique, il n'accepte pas, parce que pour lui, il ne s'agit pas de faire des, des postulats, des hypothèses gratuites, des hypothèses, il a bien fait une euh, classification philosophique des hypothèses, mais euh, intervient pas l'hypothèse gratuite. Il faut ainsi dire, euh, évidemment, vous savez ce que je veux dire, le premier principe de la théorie de la relativité. Je veux revenir à cette euh, différence de minutes. Euh, in order to render the physical principle of relativity with Galilei space-time immune to revision, Poincaré considered this as a conventional principle promoted from a law itself obtained by generalization, by a confirmable hypothesis. And this law of the, so the Galilei uh, uh, relativity principle is nature postulate, 
so say uh, uh, to, start to, to test a hypothesis and to test it, nor a convention in the sense of an apparent hypothesis characterized by the contrastive empirical underdetermination. Indeed, he says, if a principle ceases to be fecund, experiment without contradicting it directly will nevertheless have condemned it. That, that is naturally now a typically pragmatic uh, uh, construction. I cannot, uh, I cannot, because I, once I have erected it in a principle, I, it cannot be contradicted by experience. So it will be just put aside in the poubelle de, 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 de la science. And now <clears throat> it's not clear. I think before the death of Poincaré, that's the, uh, the principle the, of, um, of relativity with low and covariance was enough well confirmed to be an assailable by experience and to make this principle, and to make the Galilei principle unfruitful. The situation is what Larry Sklar has called transient underdetermination. That is, theories which are not empirical, which are not empirically equivalent, but equally or at least reasonably well confirmed. So we have the Lorentz covariance and the Galilei covariance. Well confirmed, both. But are they equivalent? It's not so sure. Naturally, they are, they are not equivalent. Uh, uh, by all evidence, we have to have in head in the moment. So we, we, we should wait as there is a, a better decision in face of new results. And I think this was, uh, this was the position of, uh, of Poincaré with respect to Einstein. So naturally, uh, Poincaré understands very well. I, I'm convinced Einstein, and, and if, you, if you read it, you, you see very well, he, he said that it's a new convention, but I cannot accept this new convention. The, I mean, the Minkowski for dimension was present in Poincaré's uh, uh, dy uh, elect uh, dynamic uh, electron in, in uh, 1905. So he has the relativity, but he was not able to say that this should be uh, now the new theory. This was Einstein, he said it. So conclusion, in favor of Poincaré as a philosopher in the analytic tradition, I would say. The actuality of Poincaré thought, the philosophical explication of scientific thought is possible through a philosophical analysis of the conventional adoption of objective relation the reality, the mathematical language structures, and experience. And experience plays a double part. It gives the occasion to be aware of the norm, and it is an occasion to test the norm in its role as an aesthetic instrument for the conceptualization of reality. You can see it very well. So we have this sensation. Then we have the general group. Then we have sub uh, subgroups and these subgroups are, uh, should be equivalent. So the rotation, translation, and all you have to really think about it. Uh, the best, the best uh, writing about uh, from Poincaré, most precise, is the foundations of uh, geometry in English in the mind, in uh, 18, 1898. And uh, and then you have to go so to experience, and from experience you you have to return. It's always this. This uh, move. The analysis of this interplay is the only possible tool to access to objective reality and to understand it, because Poincare is more to understand mathematics than to prove. Contrary to logical empiricists and to the Turing tests, I think logical tools are not sufficient for the understanding of our thoughts. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, thanks for your uh, thanks for your conference. I, I wanted to to ask you if, in your opinion, 
uh, Poincaré would accept that theories could be object of thought and object of experience. Because yes, if, naturally, naturally. Because if naturally. you accept theories yes, as object of experience, naturally, naturally. you naturally. would have another way to prove naturally. the principle of induction. Yes, naturally. This is the, the, this is the main point of, of Poincaré, that intuition is not only the intuition of the Bergson intuition or something like uh, the initial one, but intuition is learned too. This I can show why. We just published a book uh, in, by Varan, which is, shows this, this, uh, this point of, of Poincaré, how to formulate intuition that it is, that it is scraps this element of the mathematical ex experience that can be intuition of, of uh, several levels, of several uh, levels. And how to formulate it as is intuition and not conceptual. This is all the proof. You, you should go in an action theory. You should, you should uh, um, consider take the, the uh, uh, category theory because there are arrows. You should consider the arrows as action. And then you can, uh, you can reflect about the arrows at, in an intuitive way. But uh, on arrows, yeah, you, you, can, you, can, you can do this. And in a very abstract theory, it has nothing to do with, with, with sensible uh, things. But it is, in, a, in, a, in one sense, it's a sensible tool because you have the, the structure of, of a sensible science. OK. Any more questions, please? D'abord, une remarque qui n'appelle pas de réponse. Je pense euh, qu'il n'y a plus d'inconvénient que d'avantage à considérer Poincaré comme un, comme un philosophe. Parce que c'est facile de le piéger et de le mettre en contradiction. Par contre, je ferai comme Pascal, un penseur. Bon, maintenant la question. Euh, je n'ai jamais vu euh, Poincaré, à propos d'hypothèse, se référer explicitement à cette tradition qui vient de Newton, qui est reprise au 19e siècle par euh, Fourier et Ampère, qui dit l'avantage de faire une description de mathématique de la nature, des lois de la nature, c'est qu'on n'a pas besoin de savoir ce qu'il y a derrière. Je ne fais pas d'hypothèse. Fourier, euh, Fourier dit ça d'une façon remarquable. Je n'ai jamais vu Poincaré en parler. C'est quand même étonnant. Euh, et quelle, quelle est la question maintenant Qu'est-ce que c'est comme argument Donc c'est un argument non, que, et historiquement, point, point je ne connais pas. Le point carré s'intéresse à la notion d'hypothèse, enfin les différentes sortes d'hypothèses. Oui, oui. Je n'ai jamais vu faire référence au texte canonique du début du XIXe siècle français. Mais non, mais il, point carré n'était pas un historien. Il, oh, il, tout il, le monde connaissait pas. Il, 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 mais non, mais oui, mais il ne s'intéresse pas dans l'histoire comme, comme, comme argument. Pas, il ne dit pas c'est comme ça parce que dans l'histoire... Mais la première comme... phrase de Fourier, tout le monde la connaissait au 19e siècle. Mais oui, mais bien sûr. Mais oui. comme argument, moi, j'essaie je, de, reconstru de reconstruire l'argumentation philosophique de Poincaré, qui est évidemment toujours enveloppée dans les mathématiques. Et euh, maintenant, je, je m'intéresse moins à l'argumentation explicite philosophique de Poincaré, parce que celle-ci est, est toujours enveloppée de, justement dans un vocabulaire philosophique, on n'était pas un philosophe professionnel. Moi, je, veux, je vais, je vais euh, le, le chemin inverse, c'est-à-dire je regarde quels sont les résultats mathématiques, donc je les comprends un, un tout petit peu parfois, et de voir quels sont les... les, quels sont les la, la, Comment le faire cohérent d'une manière philosophique ce qu'il dit Voilà, c'est-à-dire je, je n'ai pas une approche historique dans la, à la philosophie. J'aurais souhaité que, que Poincaré s'exprime à ce sujet. Ah ben oui, ça. <rire> ah, donc... Juste à ce sujet, ça ne me paraît pas évident que Fourier a été bien connu par Poincaré. Après tout, l'édition par Darbou de la théorie analytique de la chaleur, c'est simplement quand Poincaré était jeune. Et même dans cette édition, euh, pour le, le, bon, le thème de Fourier que vous abordez, c'est-à-dire euh, il n'y a pas besoin de savoir en quoi consiste la chaleur pour étudier la propagation de la chaleur, c'est plus les commentaires autour de, de, de Fourier que Fourier lui-même. Pour Fourier, 
Son mot d'ordre, c'était « L'étude approfondie de la, chaleur, de la nature, c'est la source la plus féconde des découvertes mathématiques. » Et euh, ça, c'est le, le commentaire sur Fourier. La question sur euh, Poincaré, celle-ci. Bon, le, le travail que vous avez fait est magnifique parce que vous ne vous êtes pas contenté de regarder les écrits philosophiques de Poincaré, encore que vous les signaliez largement, mais vous, vous avez regardé la, la pratique scientifique, la pratique mathématique de, de, de Poincaré et sa pratique comme physicien. Vous avez mentionné plusieurs fois la commodité. Et je voudrais vous demander s'il n'y a pas une évolution dans la conception de la commodité selon Poincaré entre euh, science et hypothèse, mmh. la valeur de la science et dernière pensée. Oui, oui, si, si. Si, si, il, euh, si, si, il y a, ça devient plus important. Ça devient plus important. Après, les, les aspects pragmatiques se renforcent euh, clairement après 1905, 1906. Ça, il est, il est plus conscient parce que là, c'était les discussions sur la logique avec Couturin, avec les, les, les philosophes, et, et euh, il, il, est, il est pressé par le roi ensuite dans les valeurs de la science de d'être plus plus précis et euh, il, euh, il il dit que cette cette commodité et la euh, la simplicité, il fait des réflexions euh, euh, aussi euh, sur, 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 sur le, Voilà, voilà, voilà. N'est-ce pas il, il faut voir quand même que euh, Poincaré dit dans, dans Valeur de la science, il faut faire la distinction entre le fait brut et le fait scientifique. Et là, normalement, ça, tout le monde le sait. Mais quand on regarde, quand on lit les textes près, il ne dit pas ça exactement. Il dit, en fait, il y a une différence entre l'éclipse de la Lune et c'est ce que je dis, que je ne vois, euh, vois pas la Lune. Le fait brut, le vrai fait brut, ça sera seulement le premier. Mais ça, c'est subjectif. Et déjà, de t'exprimer ça dans, euh, en langage, c'est, c'est déjà un moyen euh, euh, commode pour, euh, pour, euh, pour expliquer... Euh, pour expliquer euh, la, euh, pour arti- il faut dire articuler le monde, n'est-ce pas On n'arrive pas à la, à la réalité en soi. C'est toujours par le moyen de communication, par cette, euh, ça devient, à partir de là, il a bien compris le rôle du langage. Et, euh, c'est, c'est aussi d'une manière systématique. C'est évidemment, c'est, euh, c'est correct, n'est-ce pas Vous pouvez pas voir un fait. Mais en, encore aujourd'hui, on entend parfois des gens qui disent que ce fait, euh, on, on peut voir, n'est-ce pas On ne peut pas voir un marteau. Vous n'avez jamais, jamais vu un marteau, j'espère. Non, vous ne pouvez pas. Vous, vous, avez, vous voyez ça et vous voyez ça. Mais que c'est un marteau, il faut évidemment tout une, 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 euh, un appareil conceptuel derrière. C'est ça ce que Poincaré a vu. I think that uh, we should postpone the future discussion. Let us uh, thank the speaker again.